from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. And for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory be to you. Jesus said, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, we are continuing on our fall sermon series, and we've come to the third fruit of the Spirit. And so far, we've talked about love and joy. What's the third fruit? Peace, Galatians 5, 22, 23, you can look them up uh, if you don't know them. And there's other fruit that we're going to be talking about as well. But when you hear the word peace, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? What do you hear? You know, do you get an image? Do you get a thought? It's interesting how when people hear the word peace, oftentimes what they think about is the absence of war or the absence of conflict. And for some people, that conflict that they think about is really conflict maybe in their family or with a friend or maybe in the community or even in the country. They don't necessarily think about war. But I want to take you back to Jesus' day and what people would hear during Jesus' time. Because during Jesus' time, if people heard the word peace, if they were in the Greco-Roman world, what they would probably hear is Pax Romana. Or if you're from the Jersey side of Italy, it might be Pax Romana. <laughs> and what does that mean? I mean, it means the peace of Rome. But if you think about the peace of Rome, what kind of peace was that? Was it that everybody really was genuinely at peace? In fact, really the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, was probably a very uncomfortable peace for most people. Because the enemies that were vanquished, the peace that would come from the enemies vanquished is people would be oppressed. That would be one thought that would happen. That the enemies might be under Roman rule and actually cruel Roman rule. Some of them would become slaves. In fact, they guesstimate that somewhere between a third to a half of the Roman Empire were slaves. It was a very high percentage. And at times, not only was it an uncomfortable piece, it was rather a violent piece. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Gladiator and the Colosseum and the games, a little different than most of our games, in the Colosseum. It wasn't a peaceful peace all the time. Or let's take the Mideast, the Jews. And actually in other parts of the empire, for example, when Pilate would actually slaughter Jews or Nero and what he did. I mean, you could think of many examples of this Pax Ramona, Romano that wasn't real peace. 
And maybe you, when you heard the word peace, what you thought of is maybe sunrise this morning or sunset last night or maybe sunset tonight. Or you think of looking up at the stars at the sky. Or you thinking of just sitting back and relaxing. Maybe you think of peace if the United States wins the Ryder Cup. You know, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word peace, but it, it really brings a variety to mind, and it's not always real peace, and it's not always real peace for everyone. It's just not. Because we really lose sight of what God's intention of peace was. Because if you look in the Old Testament first, before we even look at the New Testament, when you hear the word peace, most often what comes to mind for a Jew and for the Old Testament is the word shalom. And the word shalom actually is much more than just peace. Because if you look in Genesis, oftentimes the greeting was shalom. When people would say hello, when people would even say goodbye. Someone reminded me this morning that the word aloha in Hawaii is very similar to that. That it's more than just the absence of conflict or war. It's actually more well-being for the whole of your being. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, even bodily. Well-being. You know, and beyond that, prosperity. Where you're not concerned all the time about whether you're going to have enough and the conflict that that might cause for families and the pain that it would cause for families. And so, really, when someone was wishing shalom... It was so much more than that. And over time, as the people of God began to experience the shalom, and then they drifted from the Lord, and the prophets would call them back to peace, what they would remind people of is that when the false prophets say, peace, 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 that it wasn't any peace at all. That Jeremiah twice, chapter 6, chapter 8, Ezekiel, they would say, the false prophets are saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. Why? Because there was oppression and people weren't caring for one another, particularly the poor. That people were greedy. They were actually putting people in sub subjugation and in slavery and they weren't getting released. I mean, over and over again, you would see that even though Israel was saying peace, peace, it was a very self-centered peace. It wasn't what God intended for peace to be in the people of God. Because the people of God drifted from him. And they drifted from his word. And they drifted from his morality. And his desire for them. That they would live in relationship with him. And at peace with one another. And they weren't doing it. It turns out to be a terrible witness. And eventually, they would go through destruction. Because they were consumed. And that's why when you think about peace... The source of peace. Where we get peace from is God because we are in peace with God. We have his peace because we know him. We know his salvation. That we've been transformed by the cross and the resurrection. We've been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's when we really understand peace the way God intends. Because it's not even partial. It's not just self-willed. It's not just what I think it is, it's what God thinks it is, and he's able to impart it to us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And it's so far beyond sin and self-centeredness. It's his peace, as we read in Philippians 4, that passes understanding. That we can't make it happen. It's beyond us. Now, if you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, by the way, the word peace occurs in, in Scripture 420, 430 times. Most of it's in the Old Testament. But as you turn the page to the New Testament and to Jesus breaking in on the earth, what's the first thing you hear when Jesus has come? The angels announcing it, what do they say? Peace on earth, goodwill towards people. That's kind of the shalom. Peace on earth and goodwill towards other people. Everybody. Again, God's design and Jesus breaking into the world, not just creation, not just forming the people of God, but 
if you will, Jesus now bringing a new creation through salvation and eternal life and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And then you think about it, his first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. What does he talk about? Blessed are the peacemakers. That not only have we received the peace of God that passes understanding because we're his, then we're able to spread it to family and friends and then beyond to the world as we, the people of God, embody the peace of God. The peace that passes understanding. And it can only come from him and through him by his power. If we're really going to embody it and take it to the world amidst challenges and struggles and persecution when there's stresses on us, that we can live with that peace that passes understanding. Fast forward again. Jesus in the upper room with his apostles, which we read from John's gospel. Peace I leave with you, peace I give you. Now this is right before he goes to the cross and he's about to die. He's saying, I want to bring you my peace. And then beyond that, that the world does not know. Why? Because the world doesn't know him. That's why. The world cannot receive because the world has not received him, which also makes the point that we have the opportunity to experience this peace that passes understanding, this peace beyond ourselves. That's what he's saying. And fast forward again to after the resurrection and Jesus comes to the upper room and what's the first thing he does? He breathes on them and what's the first thing he says? Receive the Holy Spirit. What is breath? If you look throughout scripture, it's breath, God breathing into Adam and bringing life. See that this peace is the kind of life-giving peace that fills us fills us with life, and as a new creation, new life in him. That breath is also one of the references used for the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit blowing in us and bringing us that peace that passes understanding. It's beyond us. We can't manufacture it. We can't make it. So it's this outpouring from him. And if you look at Paul, when Paul writes his letters, how does he begin most of his letters to the new church that's now forming throughout the Roman Empire. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it gets back to who or what is the source of peace. It's God. From God. It's a gift of God as we see in Psalm 35, Psalm 122. It's a gift of God that comes to us. Grace and peace. Grace Unless we've received grace, again, God's gift, God's gift of salvation and eternal life, God's gift of the Holy Spirit working in us, unless we understand that grace, that gift, we will not understand the peace. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one that secures it. And when he ascends, he's the one that sends the Holy Spirit to us. It's understanding that that's essential to understanding this piece. Let me read to you from Ephesians. Paul writes to the Ephesians, first chapter two. For he is our peace. Isn't that an interesting way of putting it? He is our peace, why? Because he brings salvation, why? Because through him we receive the Holy Spirit. For he is our peace, in his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. This is Jews and Gentiles. That was pretty bitter. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of two, thus making peace. And might reconcile both groups to God and, and in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. See, if we really understand the cross, that's what the cross does. When we go to the cross, we're saying to the Lord, I want to die to my sin. I want to die to my self-centeredness. I want to die to self, period. And I want you to live in me. And I want your spirit to work through me. That's what he's saying. Let's go on to read from Ephesians chapter 3. 
For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. See, as we take his name, then we're united in one, which is the point that Paul's making. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you that, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. There it is. That we need to be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you're being rooted and grounded in love. See, that's the first fruit of the Spirit. When we understand that we need his love first, that it's through Jesus Christ and his love and his death on the cross that we understand the depth of God's love for us, that now we're able to bear this peace as well as experience his joy. So Paul is trying to impress upon the early church that this is where the true peace of the Lord comes from. And remember, when Jesus comes to the upper room after his resurrection, who's he talking to? He's talking to a bunch of guys that deserted him and denied him and walked away from him that are going like this and are scared because he just showed up in the room and he's saying, peace. Because what I bring you is God's forgiveness, peace. Because I bring you the resurrected presence of God now. Peace because I breathe on you and you have a down payment of the Holy Spirit. When you understand what the apostles experienced that resurrected night, then you begin to grasp what God has designed for us. And once we understand that this peace is from him and through him and then in us, then we experience the peace for ourselves, which is absolutely critical to bringing it to other people. If we don't understand that peace that passes understanding in the midst of conflict, when we're in stress, when we're angry, you know, a lot of times when I'm angry, I want to be angry. And the only way I'm not staying angry is I say, okay, Lord, you got to change me because I really want to be angry right now. That's really kind of one of my prayers. that we're able to let it go, that we're able to forgive, that we're allowing God's spirit to wash over us and be transformed so that this ministry of reconciliation that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5, where he also talks about the new creation, that we are a new creation, that we are able to let go of whatever it is we're holding on to, the stress, the conflict, the anger, the unforgiveness. And we allow God's peace to wash over us, and then we can offer that peace to other people. We become the peacemakers. We become God's instruments of peace, that we become ambassadors for the ministry of reconciliation, which Paul continues to talk about in 2 Corinthians 5. We are his peace agents because we understand peace within ourselves. We see this over and over again, Colossians. Philippians, Ephesians, Romans. We see it over and over again, and even in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. You know, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, if you know anything about that letter, the first chapter or two, what is he talking about? He's talking about the factions that exist in the church because it has to begin with the individuals and the people who are God's people. That people are saying, you know, I'm of Christ's party, and I'm of Apollos' party, and I'm of Peter's party, and I'm of Paul's party. And they're all saying, I'm more spiritual than you, jerk. How does that work? It's so contrary. And that's why by the time you progress in Paul's letter to the Corinthians and you get to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 where Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and he's basically saying, you see the power of God made manifest in you through the gifts, that God is operating in your midst. And and then chapter 14, so you can't look down on each other. You can't begin to make distinctions. And right in the middle, 1 Corinthians 13, love. Love. That when we have that first fruit of the Spirit, we can begin to experience joy in God's presence and joy with each other. And then we allow God's peace to wash over us. 
That's God's design. And then we're able to be a witness to the world. Otherwise, what kind of witness are we to the world when the world's in conflict, when the world disagrees? The only way that we can be a witness to the world is if we ourselves embrace this peace that God is offering to us and then we share it with the community of the faithful. And then we take it to the world. So that brings us to peace with the world. That's not always easy. It's just not. Because when people don't embrace Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit working them in them, it's kind of a two-edged sword. You're going out there offering peace. I mean, Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, goes out to the world to offer the peace of God that passes understanding. He offers it to the Jewish religious leaders. He offers it to the Romans. And they're not terribly interested. That it's kind of a two-edged sword. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work very well. We're not going to control that. We're not going to control other people and how they respond to the gospel or to us. You do realize that, right? You can try to make it happen. Look, would you just be at peace? It doesn't really happen. Because the world doesn't always embrace the message that we bring, the love that we bring in Christ. And see what happens. I mean, all you need to do is look at the early chapters of the Bible. You know, Adam and Eve walking with the Lord in the garden, and, and then they sin. They rebel against God. They want to be like God. They want to be the God of their lives. So their relationship falls apart, Genesis 3. And then their kids, they got major problems with their kids. Cain kills Abel, chapter 4. And then by the time people start multiplying and you get to Genesis 6 and 7, what do you got? You got a wicked bunch of people and the flood has to happen. See, it goes the other way. And that's what can often happen in the world, but it shouldn't change our focus. It shouldn't change what anchors us. Because we have Jesus Christ. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are his, if you've come to the cross and come to know him as Savior and Lord, then we can be at peace no matter what the world dishes out to us. Doesn't matter. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 12. Paul is applying the gospel that he lays out earlier. And he says, bless those who persecute you. Usually not my first choice. But that's what God tells me that I should do and I'm able to do. I can bless them. And do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. There's the community of God caring for each other. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And, and that's why... What God says is, it's not always possible. But as much as it depends on you, don't you be the agitator. Don't you be the one to bring conflict into situations. If you lay out the gospel, if you're offering peace and reconciliation, that's what we're called to do. But you can't make it happen. And that's why you live peaceably with all as much as it depends on you. Because you're the first step. Because if you know the Lord, you bring his presence and you bring the power of the Holy Spirit at work. You can pray. You can bring them before the Lord. And I love what it says later, and if you've been here long enough, you know I love this phrase. Heap burning coals on their heads. See, I love that. Because if you love them, and you live at peace while you're dealing with the challenges of the world, it can get people so angry. But that's okay. Maybe then they'll take a look at themselves. Maybe they'll, then they'll say, you know, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? Maybe they'll allow the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts because you are bearing his fruit. That's what we're called to do and to be. That we are the ones called to bear his fruit. You know, in my quiet time with the Lord over the past couple of weeks, few weeks, I've been reading from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. 
I don't know how many of you know that book, and it's really at times not one of my favorites because some of the arguments, you know, in the book, it's, it, it really falls on deaf ears to us because a lot of the arguments that the writer was using really aren't that exciting for us today. You know, we want more scripture that say, oh, I can see how this applies to my life immediately. But there's some great scriptures in Hebrews, if you know the book of Hebrews. And so as you wade through, there's diamonds to be found. And one of the ones that applies really to what I'm talking about is Hebrews chapter 7, because in Hebrews chapter 7, what you come across is Melchizedek. Now, that name probably means nothing to a lot of you, and you probably would never name your child Melchizedek. But Melchizedek is called the, the, the priest, the prince, the king of Salem. Now, if you don't know, Salem, the name Salem is a form of the word shalom. And Salem is thought to be the forerunner of Jerusalem which means the city of peace. And so this king shows up and he blesses Abraham, the father of faith for the Jews, for the Christians. He blesses him. Now what we have in Jesus, as Hebrews 7 says, is someone greater than Melchizedek. Because we have the true Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. When we turn to him and we accept him as our Savior and our Lord, we have the true Prince of Peace. And we can have that peace amidst the chaos of the world. Does anyone remember or did you watch as a kid or maybe as a young adult the show Get Smart. Any of you? Really a dumb show in a lot of ways. But it was funny. You know, and Get Smart, what was the evil group called in Get Smart? Chaos. chaos. Isn't that interesting? See, because chaos, there's a lack of peace there. Chaos is about contention and tension, and conflict, and war, and evil, and death. You see, the opposite of chaos is cosmos. And cosmos just doesn't mean creation. It means order. That what God wants to bring to our life is order. So that we can know his peace. Because he brings order to us. He brings a sense of order by his call in our lives, where we have peace with him. He brings a sense of order in giving us direction, guidelines, encouragement, the filling of the Holy Spirit. You know, so often in the world, even when the world talks about peace and really wants to make peace, it's often an uneasy peace. You know what I mean by an uneasy peace? It's like a truce. There's someone not quite happy here in a war. You see, God doesn't want us to experience an uneasy peace with him, within ourselves, with one another. He wants to bring true peace. True peace. And that peace we don't always, again, fully grasp. But we understand, if you've ever experienced it. And that peace had a price. Just like when you hear any time when you hear about soldiers and veterans and people who died in a war, that peace is not free, our peace that passes understanding is not free because Jesus Christ paid a price on the cross so that you can have that peace. That's what you need to understand. That Jesus died on the cross so that we can know peace with God so that we can know peace within ourselves, so that we can bring peace into every relationship as much as we are able. But we're only able by the power of the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that you would seek peace and seek to be a peacemaker because you know Him and you're filled with His Spirit every day. Let's pray.
Lord God, in your word, in the Psalms, you tell us that peace is a gift. And you tell us in Psalm 34 that we are to seek peace and pursue it. But it's only possible as we pursue you, as we seek to follow you, as we seek first to come to the foot of the cross, where we lay down ourselves, our sin, our selfishness and self-centeredness, where we lay down our greed. Lord, where getting smart means that we have the mind of Christ because your Holy Spirit is working in us. Lord God, this day we seek peace for those who don't know you, that they would come to you as Savior and Lord. For those of us that do, that we would empty ourselves so that it becomes less about us, more about you, more about your love and your joy and your peace because your Holy Spirit works in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.